Good morning. Hope you're doing well this morning despite how moist it is outside. I'm s s sorry, Jonathan, <laughs> but um, I, I really was going to go for your direction, but then I got this list of uh, 101 signatures, <laughs> including Mr. Bergen. So, so since he's the one who invites me to come and speak, I decided to go ahead and do that. So hope you're doing well this morning. I know the uh, tiredness is kicking in by this time of the week, but uh, I really believe that, that uh, God has a message for us today uh, that could be life transforming. And so I, I hope that as tired as you may be, that you'll be awake uh, to what God has for you this morning. As we think about the subject of hope once again, I want to ask you a question. What are you afraid of? And so here's what we're going to do this morning, a little group therapy. Would that be okay? All right. So on the count of three, you're going to yell out what you're afraid of all together. Just one thing that you're afraid of. I'm going to count to three, and you're going to yell it out. You ready? Got it? All right. One, two, three. All right. I heard mostly, mostly I heard spiders, but I'm sure there are a few other things. And by the way, that is a completely legitimate fear. All right. They say that when we are born, that we have at least two fears wired into us. Uh, the fear of loud noises and the fear of falling. But every other fear that we have is a fear that we've learned. Now, God's given us the capacity for fear. There are some fears that are good, right? There, there are some fears that God uses to protect us, to warn us when there's dangers. But there's other fears that sometimes creep in and get encoded into our way of thinking that God does not intend for us to have. And so we're going to consider this morning just for a few minutes what, what fear does to hope and, and what Jesus has to say about our fear. Because the message of the gospel is a message that should overcome our fears. Right? The message of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, that even though we had sinned and rebelled against him, that God still loved us. And he still sent his son to live in our place, right? Jesus lived a life in your place, a sinless life. He died for you as a sacrifice. And he rose from the dead. He conquered death and he conquered the grave. He appeared to his followers. He ascended to the Father and he said, As I go, I will one day come again. And so our hope is, is in the message of the gospel. It is in the rescue and the redemption that's offered to us through Jesus Christ. And we know that our ultimate hope lies in eternity. It lies in new creation. It lies in heaven. It lies in God's kingdom that is coming. But until then, right, until that time, we have to live here. And while we live here, we all deal with this thing called fear. And fear steals hope. Fear steals hope hope. Right? Fear is a thief to the hope that God wants us to live in. And we all struggle with this thing called fear. We all deal with this issue of fear. Now, uh, uh, several weeks ago, I, I decided to gather some information. And so, if you don't know this yet, when you go home, there is a Facebook page called Stalkers of Chehi. All right? It was started by some folks who had went home from camp and realized that every day all they were doing was looking at pictures on the website because they missed being here so much and so then they needed some camaraderie and it's kind of turned into our uh, little community. But, so I, I posted a question there and asked people to list their fears and so here is some unscientific data that I gathered on Facebook. Uh, things that we are afraid of and these were the, the top answers. <laughs> we're not there yet, let's start at the top. So lack of control was one, right? The, the fear of not being in control, losing a loved one, loneliness, letting others down, inadequacy, being misunderstood, life directing decisions, you know, sort of the things of college, marriage, those sort of big life decisions, snakes, all right, spiders didn't make the cut, but they probably could have, the Chehi theory exam, all right, I've heard now that it's online, it is slightly less anxiety causing. Is that true or not? Yes? No? Well, just, it just moves your anxiety to a different place. Uh, failure, hurting someone. You know, all these things would just tell us that, that we are people who are prone to fear. Right? It, it, we are people who are prone to fear. There are over 520 documented phobias. All right? How many of you would say I have at least one of those? All right. 
520 documented phobias. We are people who are prone to fear. Now, I can't talk about all different fears today, but I think one fear that distresses us more than any other is the fear of the future. The fear of the unknown. Because there's something about the unknown, there's something about the future that causes anxiety and worry to well up in us. And if we are living life anxious and worried and fearful about our future, there's no way that we can experience and live in the hope that God intends for us as His children to experience. And so I want us this morning to consider what Jesus has to say about this subject. So if you have your Bible this morning, the Gospel of Matthew chapter 6, and we're going to work through verses 25 through 34. Of course, this passage of Matthew is from Jesus' discourse uh, that we call the Sermon on the Mount. And so there Jesus is teaching a large crowd and he's really uh, inaugurating in his public ministry and he shares some very powerful and radical things. And in this section of this sermon, this message that Jesus shared, he deals with the issue of fear and anxiety and worry. And so let's begin. I want us to look at, at just the first uh, two verses, Matthew 25 and 26, and then we'll make some observations. Jesus said this, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. For what, what will you eat or drink? Or about your body or what you will wear? For is life not more than food and the body more than clothes? For look at the birds of the air. For they do not sow or reap or store away in barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? And so Jesus says here, he says, don't worry about your life. Don't worry about your life. How many of you would say, I've struggled with that? All right, that's why Jesus was talking about it, right? Because he knows us, and he knows our struggle, and he knows our tendencies, and he knows that sometimes we worry about life. That word there, worry, literally means to be pulled in different directions. All right, can you identify how many of you would say, I've experienced moments in life, I've experienced moments this week, where I felt like I was pulled in too many directions? Anybody? All right. We've all been there. And when we feel that way, we get anxious and we struggle. But look at what Jesus says. He says, don't worry about your life. And then he addresses a couple of issues that I want you to know. First of all, he addresses purpose. Right? He says, he addresses purpose. He says, you have a purpose. And look, look at verse 25. He says, is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Right? We talked about rhetorical questions the other morning. And Jesus uses several of them here. And he uses a rhetorical question to get us to think about purpose. He says, is there not a greater purpose than just surviving? Right, that, that God has a greater purpose for your life than just getting through, than just making it. Although there are some moments and some days where like, I just need to survive. But in our life, in our, the entirety of our life, God has a great purpose for your life. You have purpose. One of my favorite verses is Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. And, and it literally says that we are God's masterpiece, or your translation may say workmanship. It's the Greek word for poem. Right? It's, it's talking about something that's beautifully put together, well-crafted and thoughtfully made. You're God's masterpiece. You're some of His best work. But it says, He created us anew in Christ Jesus so that purpose, so that we could do the good things He planned for us long ago. God has a purpose for your life. God has a plan for your life. And when we think about the subject of worry and anxiety and fear and how that affects our hope, we need to remember, I have purpose. You have purpose. God made you for himself. Right? God made you for a life of purpose. God made you for a life of living in and for his kingdom. And Jesus is going to get to that in our text in just a few moments. But he wants us to see that we have purpose. And when we realize we have purpose, it helps to defeat the worry and the fear and the anxiety about my life. Because I can say, no, I have purpose. My Father in heaven who loves me and who gave his son for me, he calls me his masterpiece. He calls me his poem. And he says he's created, he has a plan for my life. And so that helps ease my 
worry. But then Jesus says there's something else. He says, look at the birds of the air, verse 26, for they do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? And so now Jesus says, not only do you have purpose, but you have value, right? That your life is valuable in the eyes of your Father in heaven. You know, sometimes in life we have people who speak that value to our life and help us to remind us that we're valuable. But sometimes you may be in a circumstance where maybe you don't feel valuable. Where whatever it is, whether it's life circumstances, whether it's someone who spoke unkindly or unfairly to you, but something has caused you to think that I don't matter or I don't have value. And nothing could be further from the truth. You are valuable in the eyes of your Father in heaven. The God of all of creation, the God of the universe, sees value in you. He says, he asks this rhetorical question, are you not much more valuable than they? You have value. Then he goes on. Look back in Matthew, verse 27. He says, now, here's another rhetorical question. Like Jesus is just throwing the rhetorical questions out. Engaging people in thought. He says, can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? Now let's just pretend for a moment that it wasn't a rhetorical question. All right, so let's answer that. How many of you think that by worrying you can add an hour to your life? Anybody? All right, so we would all agree, can't do that. But how many of us try? Right? Isn't that crazy? Right, in fact, science and medicine would tell us that actually worrying would probably take an hour off of your life. Just the opposite. He says, you can't add an hour to your life by worrying, by living in fear about the future. He goes on to talk about worry. He says in verse 28, And why do you worry about clothes? For see how the flowers of the field grow. They, they do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that even Solomon in all of his splendor was, dressed like, was not dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans, the Gentiles, they run after all these things, but your heavenly Father knows that you need them. What is Jesus saying? He says we don't have to be fearful or worry about the future because your needs will be met by your Father in Heaven. Right? Jesus promises us that our Father in Heaven will see to it that our needs, not necessarily our wants, not everything that we desire, not everything that we think we should have, but that our needs will be met by our Father in Heaven. Now I can promise you as a, as a dad, I can't give my kids everything that they want. It would not be good for me to give everything to my kids that they want. My daughter wants a horse, all right? Not happening, all right? Not, not because I don't love her, right? Because we can't afford it. But I delight, I delight in meeting my children's needs. Now, I know it's God who meets them, but as a dad, it is a delight to make sure that your kids are taken care of, that their needs are met. And I want you to know that I, I am an imperfect, far imperfect dad. But your Father in Heaven is a perfect Father. And He delights in meeting your needs. And so when we think about the fear and the anxiety that comes about the unknown, and we all fight that, we all face that, we all deal with that. But when we think about that, we need to remember that my Father in Heaven has promised that if He takes care of His creation, if He sees to it that the birds are fed, and, and that the creation is covered in the beauty that He's designed, that I can trust Him to meet my needs. That I don't have to worry about tomorrow, that I don't have to live in fear, because fear will rob me of hope. And fear will rob me of God's purposes. So how do we, how do we fight that? How do we do that? Because it's, it's easy to sit here and talk about it in chapel, right? And we could all agree, yeah, we're not going to worry anymore, right? And then what's going to happen later today and tomorrow? We'll start worrying again. So how do we fight it? How do we take a proactive step? Because here's something that I mentioned the other morning as we took, looked at Matthew chapter 8 and, and we talked about the leper, right? That sometimes God calls us to take a proactive step in our experience of faith and our experience of hope. And so Jesus says, don't just not worry, but do something, because you have to replace your worry. You just can't tell yourself to stop worrying. Have you ever noticed that? It's like telling yourself not to be nervous, right, before you perform. 
If you tell yourself not to be nervous, what are you going to be? Nervous. nervous. Right? You, you can't say, don't be nervous, don't be nervous. You'll become what you're thinking, right? You have to redirect your mind to something else. And so Jesus says, redirect your mind to something else. Look at verses 33 and 34. He says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself, for each day has enough trouble of its own. Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. He says, replace your worry and your fear and your anxiety with a passion and a purpose to live for my kingdom and my glory and my purposes. You see, something that I found happens that when I get focused on myself too much, when I spend too much time thinking about me, I get anxious and afraid and stressed and discouraged and depressed. And now I'm not saying it's not good to do self-examination. I'm not saying that we don't need to care for ourselves and, and make sure that, that, that we are growing and all those things. But when we spend too much time focused on ourselves, it never works out well. And so Jesus says, live a life not consumed for self, not consumed for your own desires or your own wants or your own ways, but seek first his kingdom, his rule and his reign. Jesus was announcing and inaugurating his kingdom. He was announcing that his rule and reign was coming once again. That he would ultimately be coming to set in order all things. But it was not yet to be fully inaugurated, right? He would die in our place so that we might experience his life in us, that we might be able to live in his kingdom. But he promised that his kingdom was coming, his rule and his reign. So it is here now in the hearts and lives of those who know him and trust him and it is yet coming in its fullness. Right? The kingdom of God is now and not yet. Right? His rule and his reign should be taking place inside the hearts of those who know him and love him. I'm a citizen of God's kingdom. If you know Jesus Christ as your savior, you're a citizen of God's kingdom. Right? And as such, we live and should live under his rule and under his reign and for his kingdom. Right? We live for him, not for us. And when we do that, it helps to defeat worry and fear because I'm not living for myself anymore. But it's hard. It's hard. Because even as we do that, right, those th there's a thousand of what-if questions that pop into our mind. How many of you, how many of you are big what-if people? All right. Look around. It's a lot of us. All right? What if? Right? We, we, we might start out and say, I want to live for your kingdom, and I, I want to do that, and I, I want to live that way, but what if? What if I lose somebody that I love? Right? What if I fail? What if I get sick? What if something bad happens? What if? What if? What are we really saying when we say what if? What we're really saying is, what if God isn't good? What if His grace really isn't enough? What if He didn't really mean what He said? What if He's faith? What if, what if God might fail me? And more than we'd like to admit, we've probably all been there. And if you're there this morning, I, I want to help you see Jesus for who He is. And to know that, that God wants to bring you back to a place of faith and of trust in what He can do. 1 John chapter 4, verse 18. It says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. Jesus, who spoke these things to that audience that day, and then ultimately to us through his inspired word, the one who spoke those things to us and for us, also loves you more than you could understand, more than you can comprehend. And it's not until we experience and know that incredible love of God for us that we'll be able to say, I can accept this message and I can put my faith and my trust in what Jesus said. That, that I can really believe him when he said, I don't have to worry about tomorrow that I don't have to worry about my needs being met, that I don't have to worry about whether God's going to come through for me or not, that I can trust Him, that I can live for His kingdom, that I can risk 
not living for my desires and my wants and my dreams, but I can risk living for his kingdom and his glory because he loves me so much. There's no fear in love. For perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been perfected in love. Right? We know that God punishes sin. But John is writing to the church and he's saying that if you're in Christ, that you no longer have to fear punishment for your sin. Because Jesus Christ absorbed the Father's wrath on your behalf. It's why Paul said in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, No condemnation, no judgment, now I dread, now I fear. Right? There's no more judgment for me. That does not mean that my Father in heaven won't discipline me. Right? He won't correct me. He will because He loves me. If I get off track, God will discipline you. Right? The Bible says everyone whom God loves, He disciplines. But His judgment, His punishment, His condemnation is no longer applied to you. Not because you deserve to be free from that, but because Jesus took your place. Because He's your righteousness and He's your hope. Because He died for you. And so the one who died for you, the one who defeated death, the one who knows you by name, He holds your life in His hands. And this is the one who's calling you to say, would you trust me? I want you to live a life filled with hope. But you can't live a life filled with hope when you're living a life in anxiety and fear about the future. And now I want you to know that this is a battle that we have to fight, not necessarily a war that we win. And so I don't want you to feel discouraged this morning. You say, man, I struggle with this so much and I must be a terrible Christian. If... No, you're not alone. We all have been there and we all struggle with this. And there will be moments where it's hard. Like I wish that we could all agree this morning that this is, we would never worry. How many of you would just say, wouldn't it be great if we could just agree this morning that none of us will ever be worried about the future again. Wouldn't that be great? And we, all, and we sign a, 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 a list, right? <laughs> wouldn't, that, wouldn't it be great if it worked that way? But it doesn't work that way. Right? It's a battle that you'll have to fight. There'll be moments where you slip and you have to say, wait a minute, I'm back, I'm, I'm, I'm worrying about the future again. Right? I've got to come back to what I know. I've got to come back to the one who loves me so much. The one who died for me. The one who rose from the dead. The one who ascended to the Father where he rules and reigns at the right hand. And the one who's coming again in one day in power and in glory. So I want to ask you this morning, what are you afraid of? If you were just really honest right now with yourself and you were in a perfect place to do that, what is the one thing, the one thing that causes the most fear right now? What's the one thing that's causing the most fear right now. And then I want you to think about, is God bigger than that fear? Is God bigger than that fear? I, I want to encourage you to write it down. Write down. You can do it now or you can do it later on. Maybe you need to reflect on it. But is God bigger is God bigger than that fear? Fears will come. Anxious moments will come. Temptation to worry about the future will come. We all deal with it. But I want you to remember some things this morning. I want you to remember these three things. The one who died for you will not fail you. Listen, no matter what trouble comes your way, no matter what trials that you walk through, you are held in the hand of the one who died for you. And he will not fail you. Right? As a parent, I will fail and have failed my children at times. Sometimes I have to apologize. <coughs> right? But your Father in Heaven will never, ever fail for you. He will never fail you. The one who died for you will also never let you go. Right? He will never let you go. I mean, there is nothing. If you're his child, if you've come by faith to place your trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior, he'll never let you go. I mean, there is absolutely nothing you could ever do to make him stop loving you and caring about you. Right? There's nothing. It's not about your performance. It's not about your behavior. It's not whether you've done your devotions or not. It's not whether you're faithfully living for him. There's nothing that will ever cause him to let you go. And that gives us hope. That no matter what happens... The one who died for me will never let me go. The one who died for you will be with you in every circumstance. 
We don't always know or understand why God allows what he does. And sometimes he will lead us in very difficult places. Sometimes he will lead us through circumstances that we don't understand. But I want you to know that when you're there, you're not alone. God has not left you. He's not abandoned you. He's not forgotten you. He's not overlooked your situation. And he's not unsympathetic towards your pain and your hurt and your care. And he loves you. And he will be with you. And he'll never leave you. And he'll never forsake you. You have purpose. And you have value. Never forget that. Life makes hope hard sometimes. Worrying about the future makes hope hard. But you have purpose. And you have value. In the eyes of your Father in Heaven. I want you to never ever forget that. I want you to write down that fear. And then really ask yourself this question. Is God bigger than my fear? And if He is, can I trust Him? Would you bow your heads this morning? And just uh, in a moment of reflection without looking around, how many would just say, I-, I want you to pray for me this morning because there's a fear that's dominating my life and I really want victory over that, but I'm struggling. Would you pray for me? Would you just raise your hand? Thank you so much for your courage, for your honesty. God sees your hand, but most importantly, He sees your heart. Let's pray together. Our Father in Heaven, this morning, I thank you for the wonderful and incredible love that you have for us as your children. It's a love that we don't deserve, and it's a love that we don't understand and cannot comprehend. But Father, I pray today that through the power of your Spirit, that you would help our minds and our hearts to comprehend just a bit of your love for us. And Father, I thank you that that you have made us to have value and purpose. Father, I thank you that you hold all of our tomorrows. And Father, I pray that when we are fearful and worried, that you would help us to run to you and to rest in you and to remember your promises and to trust you and that we would experience your hope in our lives. Father, I pray for everyone this morning, but I pray specifically for those who raise their hand. Father, who acknowledge right now, I'm struggling and I need your touch. Father, I pray, I know that you love them. These are your children whom you love. I pray that that you would minister your grace and your hope to them. I pray that you give them victory over these fears. And Father, I pray that it would be for your glory and your praise. And Father, for the advancement of your kingdom. Father, I pray that we would live lives focused on the kingdom, the, the glory that you have, and that we would live for you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.